closing, I wanted Ducey to come talk to you because he's been fundamental and instrumental in making this community happen and thrive. And he has some really good ideas here. So give it up for Michael Ducey. She always compliments, compliments me too much, and it's kind of hard to, uh, I just need a moment. Uh, so I'm Michael Ducey. Uh, I work at a company called Sysdig. Uh, we are uh, a container intelligence platform. Uh, I've worked there for about three months. Uh, prior to that, I worked at Chef for about four and a half years. Uh, I have a whole host of things that I've done in my past. One thing that I did uh, uh, in my career is performance and capacity planning. So monitoring was always something that was near and dear because the monitoring data that you would use a lot in those instances where you were needing to determine how much capacity you would need. And of course, that's changed a lot. Performance and capacity planning is still important, but the way we look at the problem is a little bit different uh, these days. So I'm going to talk about the principles of monitoring microservices. There are five principles. So monitor containers and what's inside of them. Uh, there's a tight connection between containers and microservices, and I'll get into that. Uh, alert on service performance, not container performance. Uh, monitor services that are elastic and multi-location, so your monitor needs to take into account those things. Uh, monitor your APIs, because APIs are fundamental uh, in the architecture of microservices, and I'll talk about that and give you examples. And then uh, map your monitoring to your organizational structure. Conway's law applies to monitoring as much as it applies to automation or continuous delivery or anything else that you do uh, in your environment. <laughs> And those are the five principles. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to thank our sponsors. No, but seriously. So uh, in order to understand these five principles and why the five principles apply, let's take a step back and let's talk about what's happened uh, in the world of technology over the last maybe three or four years. So how many people would say that they run uh, on some level a microservices stack in their organization? So I would say, uh, for those playing at home, I'd say that's probably about 50%. Uh, and then how many people are actually using containers uh, in production or even exploratory fashion? And I'd probably say that's 75%. So that's actually pretty good. So let's talk about these two architectural patterns and why they've come about and why they're important. So first off, let's talk about microservices. So let's define uh, microservices. Uh, if you were with us about a year ago, uh, when I give a talk about moving from monoliths to microservices, you'll remember this definition that I gave. Uh, so there's no precise definition around uh, uh, this architectural style, but it has certain common characteristics, mainly around organizing around business capability, having automated deployment, uh, intelligence as much as possible in the endpoint, so on the edge as much as possible, so where the edge can make decisions about its environment, and then decentralized control of languages and data. And decentralized control is, once again, very important, especially when we think about in the world of DevOps, right? Empowering teams so that the teams can make their own decisions. And you're probably thinking this right now, what? <laughs> uh, did you know what is actually uh, what in Dutch? <laughs> so uh, if you ever see that, that's what it means. Uh, so let's boil this down into pictures that make a little bit more sense. So you have the monoliths uh, over here. And you take those components, or basically those functions, or those services, or those components, and you break them down into these smaller components as much as possible. So you try and contain the scope of each one of those services and what that service does. And then it makes it much easier to deploy these uh, individual services instead of that entire monolith. Right? We were all familiar with that idea uh, from DevOps and Agile. It shouldn't be necessarily a new concept, though it might be to some of you. Uh, and of course, one of the first things that you often hear in traditional architectures is that uh, it's the same as service-oriented architecture, uh, but it's not. So if you had service-oriented architecture for uh, probably about almost 18 years now, maybe even 20 years now, but what microservices tries to do is bring in uh, uh, innovations in infrastructure, automation, continuous delivery, in our development best practices, and also in monitoring. And I have two highlighted right here because those are the two that I'm going to kind of concentrate on uh, today. So what you think it looks like is something like this, right? You have uh, the different clients. The clients come in from different endpoints. Uh, you have a lot of uh, API gateways. API gateways are very important, and I'll kind of talk about those uh, 
uh, as we progress. And this is kind of what you think this looks like. But in reality, the situation is probably something more like this, right? <laughs> when you actually start to blow, blow things up and actually drill down to, into the components you actually have running this architecture diagram, uh, because in, behind each one of these services, there might be hundreds or thousands of containers. And so your diagram looks more like this or maybe something more like this. This is not a knock on MongoDB by any stretch. Uh, I did not create this slide. It's actually created by someone local. I want to say his name is Dan Wilson. Woods. All right, thank you. Uh, the thing that I like the most on this slide is this says right here, you may not be able to see it, but it says Brent's desk, right? <laughs> so everyone's always had to deal with the server over under somebody's desk, right? <clears throat> But in reality, this is probably more of the typical service type architecture that you would see in a microservices type world, right? So now that we kind of have this uh, fundamental understanding of what microservices look like, let's talk about containers. So I have some bad news for you. Uh, you might have heard this once or twice before, but containers aren't real. And you might be wondering right now, What did you say? And, uh, and then you also might be wondering, well, what is this thing called Docker? We have this thing called Run C now. Rocket's there. Some, there's a bunch of other container technologies. There's Kubernetes and so forth, right? So help me understand how, if containers aren't real, how we have this huge momentum over the last four years around everyone saying Docker, 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 Docker. And you also might be, as you start to accept the truth, uh, you might be just a little bit sad about it. You know, I've given this, these slides, I think this might be the third time, and uh, I think I need to delete them because I just don't get the laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> but never worry, even though, so this is kind of like uh, the stages of grief, right? Like you get really upset when I tell you that containers aren't real. And then you start to become uh, a little bit sad and depressed. And now you realize, well, it's OK that they're not real because they are actually awesome, right? So what is a container? So the one thing I want to emphasize is that containers are not lightweight VMs. Say it with me. Containers are not lightweight VMs. And for any of the millennials in the room, oh, <laughs> the emojis didn't come over right. But however they do it, I don't know. So containers are not lightweight VMs. What is a container then? So a co container is a combination of different things. So it's a combination of an image. At the most base raw level, what a container image is, is a tar -GZ file that has a root file system and a configuration file about how the container will be ran, right? So uh, who's ever created a release management process around shipping around tar -GZs? Everything old is new again. Uh, and I say that with a little bit of facetiousness, but I also say it with a lot of seriousness. Because what we've seen over the years is that we've had this kind of perfect uh, confluence of these different technologies that have been around for a long time. And then as we've started to learn about how we can change the ways that we work, and also some of the other technological advancements that have happened, uh, what Docker has brought to the table over the last four years around how containers work and kind of normalizing that process of containers has brought these fundamental changes about. And all, all the other companies in the ecosystem as well, like Google and Microsoft and so forth, right? C groups. Uh, C groups is something inside of the Linux subsystem, inside of the Linux kernel itself, and I'll talk about those here in a second. Uh, something else called namespaces, which is also a feature of the Linux kernel. Uh, and then something called SC, or I'm sorry, uh, Linux security modules. And I think most of us are familiar from Linux security modules. Uh, if you've ever done any systems administration work or if you're a developer that has attempted to ever configure a system, of course, the first thing you do is always turn off SC Linux, right? Yeah. Uh, I was in a talk one time uh, that was the uh, creator of SC Linux, uh, and he was going to talk about how to configure something, and he said, the first thing you do is turn off SC Linux. <laughs> And then you turn it on later, but you know, I always thought it was humorous that he said that. So let's talk about what containers are, and let's kind of compare them to concepts that we're familiar with. Uh, so we have concepts uh, that we're probably most familiar with 
uh, VMs, right, or instances in something like Amazon. Uh, we have jails uh, and we have zones as well. Uh, probably the jails and the zones, while we use them to some extent, uh, they're probably not as used as extensively as we could have. Uh, VMs are used a lot because, mainly because they give us this level of isolation, right? Whereas jails and zones don't necessarily give us as much isolation. But these are what's known as first class concepts. I can talk to Solaris and I can say, Solaris, please give me a new zone. I can talk to ESX or I can talk to Amazon and I can say, Amazon, please give me a new VM. If I talk to the Linux kernel and I say, Linux kernel, please give me a container, the Linux kernel is going to say to me, I don't understand what a container is. And that's why we have things like container runtimes that bring together these three concepts of C groups, namespaces, and the Linux security modules, okay? There was a very good talk on this uh, given by uh, Jesse Frazzle, um, or Fazel, sorry. Uh, her slides are listed here, and I'll post these slides afterwards. And also, she has a very good blog post on this as well. She gave this talk at DevOps Days Minneapolis uh, last year. So let's talk more about what this concept of a container is. So containers differ heavily from VMs and how we're familiar with VMs from the main perspective of uh, in the old way, this whole thing would be considered a VM. And you'd have multiple applications running on top of the VM, and then you'd have multiple kernels that would be stamped out over and over and over again, right? So this whole gray box would be considered a VM. In the container world, this is the actual abstraction of deployment, or unit of deployment, right? So we have the application and we have the libraries. The really, really important thing is, is that in a VM world, uh, you don't share a kernel. You're isolated from everyone else's kernel. In the container world, uh, each container is sharing the exact same kernel over and over again across all of your hosts. And this is very important when you think about how you're going to go and monitor that container, right? So in the old world, what you would do is you would put a monitoring agent on every single host or every single VM that you would actually want to go and monitor. The host operating system was isolated uh, uh, in several ways from the guest operating system, so you couldn't necessarily go and see everything that was running inside of it. Now what's interesting in the new way is that containers can actually get access into other containers, right? And that's through using those concepts that I talked about before on the previous screen. So you can have, there's a couple different ways that you can do this. You can have one container that sets there and monitor all the other containers because they're sharing that same level at the kernel. Or what you can do is you can deploy containers alongside other containers. We call them sidecars. And those sidecars can reach into your application containers to monitor them. So let's talk about more about what makes up a container and why this is important. So the first part that makes up a container is called a control group. And a control group is basically a limit on resources. So it basically allows you to uh, limit how much resources your application is using. Uh, and those resources are things like memory, CPU, network, uh, I.O., and so forth, right? So I can get very specific in that an application can only use uh, one megabyte of memory, or one gigabyte of memory, sorry. Why would you use one megabyte? <laughs> I don't know why megabyte jumped into my head. Uh, namespaces are all about what resources can be accessed, right? So where C groups are about controlling the quantity, namespaces are about controlling the what, right? And what this allows you to do is restrict access to network devices. It allows you to restrict access to other PIDs, usernames, uh, hosts and so forth. And so what this allows you to do, and if you remember in the concept of having that sidecar, you basically take a sidecar and you assign it the same uh, namespace that your container that you're wanting to monitor, uh, you, you put it in the name, same namespace and now you have access to those same resources. It's like those processes are running alongside each other on the exact same host. Whereas if you don't give access to that namespace, then they appear isolated from one another and the containers don't necessarily know that the other containers exist. And then the last component is uh, Linux security modules. So we have things like SE Linux. SE Linux is about uh, a system-wide execution policy and restricting what can be done on the entire host. App Armor is more about system-wide execution policy but focused on individual processes. And then SecComp 
uh, is also used. And suckconf is very interesting because what it gives you is system call isolation. So you can basically say that certain processes cannot access certain system calls. So this allows you to cut off entire parts of the operating system from the container. Make sense? And this feels like magic, and the reason why this feels like magic is because you have an abstraction layer, right? You have a container image and you do a Docker run or you do a run C run, uh, and you have that container image extracted. That container image uh, uh, is extracted, put onto the file system in a certain location, and the container runtime or the container engine, something like container D, will go and actually create the C groups for you, the namespaces, and then also the, apply the appropriate LSM uh, policies as well, right? And so for us as a, as a user, it feels like containers are a first order object or first level object, even though they aren't. And this is all important when we come back around to talk about these five principles. So let's talk about now containers and microservices together and how these two combine kind of give us this power that we're starting to see as we think, start to rethink our architectures. So if we think of containers uh, and sign up common, commonality between microservices and containers, uh, you have limited scope. Uh, so containers are supposed to be as isolated as much as possible. They're supposed to be focused on running one single process uh, if possible. Uh, they should be easily deployable uh, as well. They need to be immutable. Uh, and then they should also be versionable as well, right? And immutability doesn't necessarily mean uh, at runtime, but it means in the artifact that you're shipping, uh, that artifact might be immutable. And there might be a little level of mutability when the container actually starts because it needs to download a configuration uh, from a Kubernetes config map or something like that. From a microservices perspective, you have the exact same concepts, and that's why these start to overlap very heavily. And as we saw the rise of containers, microservices has been around just as long as containers have been around, right? Uh, in doing research for some presentations recently, uh, I ran into an article by IBM that was from 2009 talking about LXC and Linux containers and how they were the next great thing, right? And that's 2009, so nine years ago. Uh, and Martin Fowler and uh, Jez Humble talked about microservices uh, a long, long time ago as well. Now as these two things have kind of come about together and matured, that's where we start to see this... Um, I want to say synergy, but then you would realize that I work in marketing. <laughs> this, this overlap between the two. Uh, same thing with microservices. Your individual services should be uh, limited in scope. Micro doesn't necessarily refer to the size of the service. Uh, what it means is basically the scope of the service and only doing one component very, very well, kind of like the Unix philosophy, right? Uh, you have CDUs for deployment as much as possible in a microservices type world because you have so many services, the deployments do have to be automated. Uh, because the uh, services have to be automated uh, in that deployment fashion, you have to have service guarantees so that other services can expect a service to be there. If that service isn't there, then you need a way to notify the other service that it's not available. Think of when you go into Netflix and um, continue watching for Michael, I, it just frustrates the hell out of me, and especially when I know why it's happening. But you go into Netflix and you don't get to continue watching or you don't get a certain section. It was like, this is the only thing that I wanted. Uh, and that's because it's having, they're doing a deployment or a service has been taken offline or something like that. And the other services can automatically switch off when that other service has to go down or there's a performance degradation. Uh, and then of course, versionable APIs so that other microservices as you do bump your version, uh, if there are other services that haven't updated their API yet, you're still able to do that communication between the two. So basically what the idea is, containers make microservices easier and microservices make containers easier as well, right? And it makes this entire process much, much easier. And what you have to realize, of course, is when we're looking at this microservices model, as I talked about before, uh, behind each one of these services, are uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 serv uh, uh, containers that you're actually running. So when you actually think about what you're needing to run and what you actually care about, the unit of work is actually the service, not actually the container behind that service, right? And your performance guarantees need to be on the service, 
not necessarily on that object that you can very easily roll, you can very easily deploy, you can destroy, bring up a new one, uh, and you have that elasticity. And that is what this actually is showing is that they're behind each one of this pretty diagram. When you actually blow it out, this is what it actually looks like in reality. And this is untenable and unmanageable, so you can't look at things this way. So you have to find a new way that you look at things, right? And so let's dive back into these five principles. So uh, the first one, monitor containers and what's inside them. Uh, so this is a paradigm shift. Right? What I've just described to you is that the unit of work and the unit of thing that we're managing has shifted to this VM and this thing that we're very familiar with. So VMs basically just took this concept of servers and everyone was really comfortable with servers in their data center and now we got virtual servers, right? And so that's cool, it's a paradigm we're familiar with. But this paradigm has changed, right? Uh, you might have seen a diagram that basically shows uh, the production cliff of containers uh, and there's basically all this work to, in development. It's just, you know, the container runtime engine. But in production, you have all of these worries about monitoring the container runtime, image distribution, uh, networking, security, uh, all these uh, service discovery, DNS, all these actual real world things that you have to worry about, right? And so the paradigm has shifted and we have to change the way that we think about the problem. And the way that we have to think about the problem is that your unit of management has changed from servers to isolated processes, right? Because remember, you're having a shared host between all of your containers, so you have to look at the process level and not necessarily always the host level. And so your monitoring needs to focus on these isolated processes in two different contexts. So I would say in the context of the container and making sure that when you're spinning up these containers, you're uh, spinning up these containers with the proper resource limits from the get-go. Um, and what you'll realize is, is that if you're spinning things up with the proper resource limits, uh, other things will take care of themselves, right? And what I mean is, is that you have things like the orchestrator, that if you make them aware of these resource limits and the scaling resources that you need uh, to actually run that container, it will bring up the other containers that you need if you're hitting those resource limits in some other way. It also helps you identify when in, in terms of monitoring it helps you identify when other people are being bad actors, right? So if somebody's consuming a whole bunch of other resources, which you're gonna see instead of the entire site going down or the entire host going down, what you would see is something that uh, the individual container's dying and you're seeing thrashing where containers go and serve a lot of work and then all of a sudden they die. Go and serve a lot of work and all of a sudden they die. And that shows that you're uh, not, the actual application itself is not being careful with resource limits. Monitoring needs to focus on thus the application itself and how the application is performing. So things like metrics about how your actual individual functions inside of your application are running. And you see this in the areas of things like Prometheus where it makes it very, very easy for application developers to instrument their application code and then port those metrics back so that it's much easier to actually see the actual health of the service which is what's important, uh, not necessarily the individual resources on the containers. Uh, you need to be able to discover the metrics automatically for your language runtime, application services, and database. So remember back to this idea of empowerment. Uh, you don't necessarily know what's going to be put inside of that container, unfortunately. Uh, that's why resource limits are very important. Uh, but also because you don't know, you should be able to automatically discover what's inside of that container so you can start monitoring it properly. Uh, and in the same way of automatically discovering metrics that have been exposed by developers, and having the container or microservices automatically inform the monitoring of that as well. So number two, uh, alert on service performance, not container performance. Uh, and this is a little bit uh, of a different mind shift from us, for us when we go from the pets to the cattle type model, right? So um, I'll just tell you what this graph is. Um, so ignore the Kubernetes bit, but that, you know, I had to put Kubernetes in here at least once or twice or nobody would show up. Uh, so this is the average lifetime of containers. And uh, what I wanted to kind of illustrate here is that containers churn a lot, lot quicker than other objects that we're used to having, right? So you can see here anywhere, depending upon where you're running them, either in Kubernetes or Docker, uh, 
Uh, you have about an average lifetime of a container in Kubernetes about one and a half days. Uh, in Docker, this is probably about two days. Whereas out here on, um, that's probably more like three days. Out here in ECS, this is about 12 days, right? So um, who's ever had to fight with uh, the change management or whoever runs ITSM or whoever and be like, how can we have all this stuff spinning up automatically? We can't track it and like, how am I supposed to get the asset tag at the container, right? <laughs> so the thing that you have to realize is that the unit of thing that you're measuring and that you're actually observing, uh, you're looking at it at the wrong level, right? And these individual units of work uh, uh, are basically disposable units of work that you shouldn't necessarily have to track. What you have to track is the actual service it's, itself and how the service is behaving not the individual containers themselves. Now, if there's a problem and you have to go and troubleshoot them, of course, you would first dive into the container level, possibly to see what's actually going on on the container level. And if you're interested in doing that, Sysdig has a great workshop around container troubleshooting. Uh, so the point is, come on, laugh a little bit. <laughs> Am I putting everyone to sleep? It's only been 25 minutes. Uh, so. What you want to do is you want to basically realize that containers don't last long. And so your metrics and your thresholds need to be set on that actual service itself. And so your monitoring platform should be able to pull in those services from whatever orchestration engine is, or maybe even whatever uh, service mesh or something like that that you're using uh, to create those services in that microservices architecture. And what you really need to worry about is the thing that you're doing, is the thing doing the thing it's supposed to be doing and in a timely manner, right? So is the service performing the way that we expect and is it doing it in a timely manner? And things like uh, performance of individual containers, you should allow the orchestration uh, layer to worry about those and let the orchestration layer handle the things like auto-scaling or killing bad containers. And that's why it's really important that you put in those resource limits that we talked about in principle one. So number three. Uh, monitor services that are elastic and multi-location. So you have to uh, build your idea of monitoring with the notion that things are going to be elastic and multi-location is basically what this is saying. And there's an old mantra. Uh, I want to say Adam Jacob is uh, uh, the first person that I heard say this, uh, this, my old boss, the CTO of Chef. And he basically said, you don't have a scaling problem until you have a scaling problem, right? And most of us try and go in and we're like, you know, we have high hopes for the thing that we're building and we want to go in thinking that there's going to be 10,000 users from day one. There's going to be a million users in the first month and we have to build this thing with all the bells and whistles to make sure that we handle this because I know this thing's going to blow up in a month, right? But the reality of the situation is, is uh, it's probably not that serious uh, and you're probably not going to have that scaling problem. But what's interesting is, is that in a microservices type world, it's very easy to start doing the right things. So you have this elasticity built into your infrastructure and your architecture from the get go, right? And so uh, as you approach microservices and you approach monitoring them, you have to realize that things are going to scale horizontally and automatic, automatically you need to be able to pull in those new nodes as they come in. You need to be able to aggregate data across multiple locations and so forth. So microservices pushes us into this idea of handling these scaling problems by design. Now, if you uh, were at my talk in, uh, uh, last year or more like maybe 14 months ago, uh, I had talked about don't necessarily uh, think about that you have to go into a microservices world right away. You can still write a monolith from the start and then you can start to break down that monolith when you actually do get successful into that more microservices type model. And what's interesting is when you start to follow those microservices practices, uh, the scaling problems actually get much more manageable, right? But you do have to take into account of how your monitoring scales with your service. So if you're going to jump from 10 containers to 100 containers uh, in one event, how is your monitoring going to handle that? Are nodes automatically going to get added in? Is the service automatically going to scale out and catch all of that information coming from not only from the containers themselves uh, and aggregated at the service level, but your applications as well? 
And then you also have to worry about how you aggregate that microservice performance across cluster sites, locations, and regions as well, uh, because you may not be located in one uh, availability zone or one data center as well. This is, I think, probably the most, uh, one of the most important ideas. Uh, I used to work for a company in Minneapolis uh, uh, called Instratius. Uh, and one of the things that I liked about my time there is I worked with a gentleman by the name of George Reese. Uh, and he was very, very heavy on this idea of APIs. And uh, this was probably in 2012, I want to say. So cloud was really just getting started. And what Instratius did was multi-cloud monitoring. Uh, and this was basically, a, or not, uh, multi-cloud management. So this was basically an overlay layer that basically gave you access to a whole bunch of different cloud providers and you had a nice console to do everything there. Um, what George really taught me though, regardless of the product and what it did, what he made me realize is that uh, everything is moving towards an API type world, towards a service type world. And when you think about how we need to do our operations we need to think about things in an API type perspective. So how can I integrate with other tools? Uh, how can I request new infrastructure via an API? How developers want to interact with an API to the request their infrastructure and so forth. And this goes really heavily into the microservices type world. Whereas in, each front of, uh, in front of each one of these services, you're going to have an API gateway, right? And if you've ever done anything uh, with serverless or started looking at serverless, the API gateway is kind of a, a core component of the services type arch serverless type architecture. Uh, it's also a core component of um, uh, a microservices architecture. And you might have, um, how many people put HA proxy in front of every single individual instance of their application? A few people raised their hand. So this is actually fairly common. And the reason why is because HA proxy has ways to actually tell other services that it's unhealthy, right? So you may not necessarily have that built into your application, but your individual components of your service can then notify the other services that it's unhealthy and it can be brought out of that API gateway. And then the API gateway is basically that common endpoint that everyone goes in. But the, com the problem is, is the API gateway is basically where uh, all of the uh, problems are that you're going to see, because this is basically where you aggregate on the service level, right? And so APIs are the primary com communication path for microservices, right? And this is not only just for microservices that you run. Uh, if you're talking about uh, using other cloud services, uh, like uh, RDS or S3 or SQS or Bridget named some Microsoft one. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Uh, Azure things, right? That's an API you're also hitting and you need to be able to have visibility into not only those external APIs, uh, but you also need to aggregate on your own API level. And the reason why is you wanna be able to connect uh, catch certain bottlenecks, or you want to catch bottlenecks in certain methods, functions, and endpoints. And when you can monitor on the API level, you can do things like seeing what URLs are being hit the most, right? And you can see if the, you need to actually break off that particular component that keeps getting hit into its own microservices to be able to handle the traffic and load off other traffic of the other APIs or the other API endpoints that are getting hit. Uh, you can also see those frequently used methods and functions and endpoints. You can also see if one all of a sudden starts to go bad. I actually had to do this with a customer last week, uh, and they said, we keep having this external service, and this external service, all of a sudden we get a blip, and uh, performance goes down on our application, and we don't know where it is. We're pretty sure that it's this external service. How can we look in the monitoring to see is it the external service or is it something actually inside of our application that with this one request, things start to go bad? And we were able to find that for them. And then the other thing that's important is that you need to be able to trace the behavior of your application through multiple systems. So you need to be able to trace that user request that's coming in and be able to trace it across all of your different services so that you can aggregate. And when you have that API gateway and you're monitoring that API gateway properly, you're able to trace the individual transactions or users through that service much more easy, easily when you're looking at things on that aggregated service level. Uh, and lastly, uh, map 
monitoring, uh, map your monitoring to your organizational structure. So uh, any DevOps presentation would not be complete without invoking Conway's law. Uh, I think the other thing I need to do is quote Gene Kim at some point. <laughs> See if I can squeeze that in by the end. Huh? Brent is in it. In your oh, Brent is in it. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I've quoted the Phoenix Project. Thank you. Uh, so Conway's law basically says is that any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So, because A is going to talk to B, and then so the architecture design is just going to be that way, and B is going to talk to C, and so forth. And so, your Conway's law basically applies to your monitoring as well, right? So you're going to be able to monitor the things that other people tell you about, uh, and you need to have this idea of small teams loosely coupled that are empowered to choose their own direction, right? And what you want is basically uh, the teams to choose what they can put into those containers, but they also choose how they can monitor those containers as well. So you might want to have a certain set of baselines that they would use or a certain set of overall view that you're going to take of the world. But when the actual application teams themselves start to dive into actually how they monitor things, uh, those choices need to be able to be, they need to be empowered to make those choices on their own and your monitoring needs to be able to take those things into account. And so the idea is that Monitoring needs to be able to allow your teams to define their alerts, their metrics, and their dashboards, not necessarily have them forced upon them from a central authority, which often happens. They're the ones that know how the application is going to perform the best and the things that they need to look at because they've written the code. Uh, someone's shaking their head about that, and was, maybe that's not true. Um, and the centralized authority needs to kind of provide that common standard and structure, but the teams need that flexibility and be loosely coupled from the overall organization. So to recap, no, to sum up, uh, containers change how we monitor applications. Containers also change how we actually deploy applications and how we think of the unit of compute greatly as well. Uh, microservices also change how we monitor those services, right? Uh, much smaller services, uh, maybe smaller services, much more um, uh, well-defined scope in what they do. Uh, and then the five principles of, uh, of monitoring microservices. So monitor containers, alert on service performance, take into account elasticity and multi-location, monitor APIs, which I think is the most important and compelling part of this, uh, and then map uh, to your organizational structure as well. So with that, uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. I believe there's a microphone, so uh, maybe raise your hand uh, and we'll do the best to get your question answered. We will definitely do Q&A, but first, give it up for Michael Ducey. Okay, um, so please raise your hand if you have a question and I will run a mic out to you so that it can be on the recording. We have a question right here. Hi. So Hi. the best place or the best way to monitor a background process, a DNS or an API or some sort of queue runner, like what would that be? How would you automate that so that I could make sure and monitor whatever it is I'm trying to do? It's a container, mm -hmm. but it's doing a certain thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's doing. How do I monitor that? That's where the benefits of this diagram comes in. And looking at things from this view, just one second. And this is actually a benefit of containers that makes it a lot easier. Uh, because you're able to plug into the kernel level and you're not monitoring things at a process level, you start monitoring things at a kernel level. You're able to actually see when those new processes come up and that background job or that batch job comes up. And then you're able to capture that information at that point in time. Versus where in traditional monitoring, you're actually focused on monitoring those app components themselves. And you don't necessarily know when they come up and they have to subscribe to monitoring. Versus having an overall agent that's actually looking at every, everything that's going through on the kernel level. Does that make sense? I'm sensing confusion in your face. We have a follow-up to that question. Please onboard your other questions after that. No, that makes sense. Okay. To, to a certain degree. 
what if you're like managing like HTTP requests on, let's say, a load balancer or something like that? That's kind of away from your architecture. That would be like a different beast. That would be within. a different beast altogether because you then have to be able to get into uh, that load balancer provider needs to provide to you uh, either a stream of data that you could then incorporate into your monitoring system, uh, or you need to be able to uh, pull that API to get that monitoring data out. Uh, and that's more of a problem when it comes into things like uh, hardware-based application load balancers versus software-based application load balancers in a cloud provider or something like that. So attributing the process to a specific container, how do you... Oh, you so the process actually, the container is basically, uh, your, your monitoring should be able to map that container to a specific process. So what the container runtime does in this world is basically what you do is you assign a process to a namespace and a C group. And so basically then they have that mapping between those C groups and namespaces. And usually what container monitoring does is it uses either C groups as usually namespaces to create the container artifact. And then that's assigned to PIDs that run into that namespace. Does that make sense? Yeah. I can give you an actual physical example of it that would act afterwards if you would like. Hi, this is Dave. Um, Hi, Dave. When we start talking about monitoring and maybe I'm going too deep into the infrastructure, but let's just say you have a container running a database platform and persistent storage. How do you monitor those types of things like you might have ran out of space or something's going on at the data layer that is preventing this thing from performing? Uh, I think those would be done pretty much how we traditionally have do them. You put monitoring on the host system uh, or you put monitoring so it all depends upon how you're doing uh, uh, the storage. So if it's a back-end storage system, uh, if you're using a SAN SIL or something like that, uh, you would have that same monitoring on the host that would actually be monitoring that. Uh, also, what you might do is using local disk storage as well, and then the monitoring would be done the same. This, this view of the host world, there's still a lot of things that you do want to look at on the node level or on the host level as well. And those would still be done on the traditional level. I think what's different is how you actually monitor things on the application layer and as things come up and down in a more dynamic way. Yes, Donnie. <laughs> um, it, it was good to see you provide a little bit of clarity on your view on monitoring versus alerts. I mean, could you expand on that? Like, if you think about a lot of people here might work at bigger companies, you got 24 7 teams already, so on call isn't really the same kind of problem it is. Yep. But how do you think, what do you? really alert on and say, you have to do this now versus what do you monitor for digging into after the alert comes out? Um, I think the main thing that you have to monitor for is uh, user impact, right? Uh, and that's the idea behind, so if a container starts to have bad performance, so kind of the, taking the example that I gave earlier and expanding it up to a higher level, uh, if the container starts to have in problems and you have to kill the container and the container orchestrator brings a new one up, that may not necessarily have any impact on the end user. But then when you start to monitor things at a service level or on an API level, and you monitor the health of that and the performance of that, that's are the things that you actually want to start to alert on because that's when the actual use end user might be impacted. And usually what you'll see is you'll see uh, the bottleneck kind of shift through the entire uh, architecture stack, and at the very end, it will come out to the user. Yes, Jim. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I've I've been trying to get my arms around and get other people to understand, but we use monitoring as kind of a catch-all, all-inclusive, um, and and I don't see people making a distinction between, for instance, telemetry versus monitoring, and and so the comparison that that I've been trying to advocate is that monitoring is the, as you stated, you give it to the groups, it's for mm -hmm. catching something that is urgent and actionable. The telemetry is all that other stuff that you use once you've got an alert to help diagnose and, yeah. and triage what's actually going on. That's a good point. And, and I see in, in your presentation though, it's, everything talks about monitoring. Mm -hmm. do, do you ever make that distinction? Is that a reasonable approach? Uh, I think it's a reasonable approach. I would also see telemetry as um, showing the health of the business maybe as well, and showing, looking at telemetry more from a way of uh, when you're driving down the road, you kind of know that the car is working okay, 
uh, say, for instance, my, the driver that I had today, uh, it sounded like his car was revving at 6,000 RPM, uh, but we were just going down the highway and it was only at 2,000. So that telemetry right there tells me that there's probably something wrong that needs to get fixed. But I don't necessarily make that distinction. I think also people make the distinction between observability and monitoring as well. Um, so there's different terms that you could use that are meaningful for other people for different reasons. But I think you're right. It's, like, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, yes? So two questions. Uh, how do we acquire a copy of your slides? So <laughs> so number two, how do you acquire SysTig, right? Uh, so uh, if, you, if you really want to know how you acquire SysTig, you can uh, just go to SysTig.com. <laughs> and you just say, try it now. There you go. Uh, I'll post the slides to the meetup, though, afterwards. The slides and the video. The video, the slides will be in the next day or so. The video may take a couple of but both of those will be on comments of this meetup on meetup.com. Got one over here. Yeah, no, I'm more important than Wyatt. Uh, <laughs> Andy. Hi, I'm one of the Andys. Hey, uh, do you see, Hi, so, so, uh, so one of the things that I, I think, um, as we've gone down uh, this journey a bit, I love the the monitoring, like how you called out monitoring the API specifically is one of the most important parts because I think we ran into similar challenges where it's like just overall is the service healthy or not. Curious if you have any tips or tricks as you build out a microservices architecture and start to have many services that depend on each other. Have you seen anything that's helpful in terms of managing those interdependencies, making sense of them, helping teams understand um, when they might, might be dependent on each other? and maybe the service that they're dependent on has gone down. So their service isn't necessarily unhealthy, but another one is. Um, what are you seeing folks in the industry do that, that helps them do that successfully and make sense of kind of the general chaos of all that interdependencies? Yeah. Um, so what we see works really well, and what we do to solve that problem for our customers is that we pull wherever that metadata exists of that interdependency and then map the monitoring or the telemetry to whatever that orchestrator view of the world is, right? And so the orchestrator is going to have a very good view of these are the services, these are my deployments, these are actually pods that actually make up that individual service. Uh, and then um, we take that data along with data we get from the host as far as uh, who's talking to who from an IP perspective. And then we can create basically a topology map that shows you how those services are talking to one another and the performance between each one of those services are. Inside of the service as well, uh, as, cross, uh, as well as across the links uh, as well. So how do I get SysTig again? <laughs> uh, let me just show you. Uh, if you didn't and, catch it the first time. And if you didn't catch it the first time, SysTig is open source. They also have commercial offerings. So you can certainly go use open source SysTig. Yeah, we have, uh, so the open source tools, uh, they're SysTig.org. Uh, or sysdig.com slash open source. Uh, it's basically TCP dump for system calls. It's pretty damn cool. Uh, it's one of the main reasons why I went to go work for the company uh, is because I love that technology. And uh, I'd used TCP dump and Wireshark. Uh, the founder of the company actually uh, was one of the creators of Wireshark uh, as well. So it's a pretty cool tool. So uh, I know that this wasn't really your point, um, but I'm, I have this burning question uh, about one slide. Sure, which why slide? Was, why was Kubernetes uh, like cycling containers much, much faster than ECS? And uh, it said Docker, which was kind of uh, weird because both of those use Docker. But um, what, what's up with that, that thrashing? Uh, I, what I actually think it is, is that I think the maturity of the people that are using, this is Datadog's uh, slide, so, you know, I've heard they're kind of full of crap. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we should all, uh, the, we were at, uh, I was at Config Management Camp last week, which is basically Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, MGMT, and all the con big con config management vendors get together. Uh, and one thing that was brought up there is like tribalism is bad and we should all be nice to each other. So I'll joke about Datadog, but uh, we love everyone in the community equally, right? And that's important. And so I'm happy to use their slide. Uh, I think it's the maturity. 
I think if you're at the level where you're going to start deploying Kubernetes and deploy an orchestrator, uh, you have some level of maturity around how you build containers and that whole process and that chain to get them into Kubernetes, uh, that you're able to do those things much easier uh, around that. And I think also some of the paradigms around Kubernetes makes it a lot easier as well. So you, what you're saying is if you're at the point where you're using Kubernetes in production, you probably are not treating containers as a lightweight VM. Yes, yes. Whereas uh, because you don't have that same management structure, and again, this is not a knock against ECS, but because just ECS doesn't have that same functionality and completeness as an orchestrator, or at least it, it didn't used to when this survey was done, uh, it's much harder uh, to not treat containers as lightweight VMs. Ooh, all right, Donnie wants to weigh in. Uh, Donnie. <laughs> He's running to the mic. Can't, can't get away from my, my former background. Um, so I was at the Amazon conference last fall, and that's pretty much what I saw. Like all the customers who were using ECS, they were pretty much lift and shift into containers. Mm -hmm. And everybody using Kubernetes was much more like, let's do the whole cloud native, refactor, right. migrate everything, and not just, oh, we're in containers now with like a managed container server running in Amazon somewhere. And we've got SAP in a container now, and it's great. <laughs> it, it can be done. Is it great? Is it? And just one more thing to weigh in on that. Um, Kubernetes can be really aggressive about rescheduling containers. Um, so they can just live for a short amount of time because they move somewhere else. So rebalancing the nodes and the load across the nodes. Uh, yes, one in the back. OK, Ooh, I, am, I am heading your direction with some amount of alacrity. So you talked a little bit about decentralizing, uh, empowering teams, uh, developers. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from a company that has more centralized operations, how do you uh, suggest pushing and helping uh, move that so that the teams feel more empowered to be able to control their operations and even um, managing production? Ooh. I have a suggestion. I have a suggestion. Were you? Did you? Were going to answer that? I, I have an idea. Oh, he has an idea. I'm, I'm like, I have an answer for it. I don't know if the developers want to hear it, which is offer to be on call. If you're going to be on well, call for I your think, service, I think it more goes along the lines of while well, Bridget walks the mic up to this fine gentleman in the front, uh, who's going to answer the question for me. I think it's more going along the lines of. Once again, we're into this battle of like centralized IT has this tool. Uh, we've been doing monitoring with this tool for a very long time. And they don't necessarily understand the architectural paradigms and how they're different, and that things are just going to be spinning up, and you need to be able to take those things into account. And the operations team doesn't necessarily understand it yet, or centralized IT doesn't. Zachary? I, I think having patterns for how to roll out your own stuff is really important. Uh, a lot of developers don't understand how infrastructure works, and if you do infrastructure as code and you have good patterns for how to roll out new services and to deploy code and how you implement like all of that stuff, it makes it a lot easier to share those burdens uh, because yeah. they have better a better grip of how everything works. Yeah, uh, I definitely say show that you're a responsible uh, community member because you like your work is, is, is part of the community. Uh, as you go down this path of trying to deploy microservices and containers and whatnot, um, uh, help them understand that these paradigm shifts change, or that this is a paradigm shift, and that the way that we've traditionally done it um, needs to change. And I think usually what I've seen in the past, since I, I keep saying this like in the last five years in the DevOps world is, you have to kill them with data. You have to actually show them that either the tool that they have or giving you is insufficient for the job, or that you need this level of monitoring, or that you have containers that are changing every one and a half days, and how am I supposed to subscribe them to the monitoring service when the containers run up? Or you shouldn't be running monitoring processes inside of the containers and other things like that. And they, you have to educate them. And it's, uh, I was talking to Jason, and you know, Jason's been in the DevOps world for a long time. Where's Jason? Jason Walker of Cargill is in the back somewhere. He's hiding. But he was just talking about it's 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 a struggle, right? I mean, like 
every every evolution uh, you have to convince people once again of like this is the thing that you have to do and this is the approach that you have to have and unfortunately there's no secret sauce it's just chop wood carry water chop wood and carry water <laughs> all right a shout out to andrew clay schaefer there um thank you so much mr miyagi and uh if you can uh give it up once more for michael ducey